So yeah, um, welcome to my talk, Projections for Gamification in a Social App. I'm Anton Stöckel at Tony Belloni on Twitter and um, on, on Mastodon. I live in Munich, uh, yeah, doing this job for quite a while. And I'm uh, recently um, a principal learning designer for a software developer, so I'm not a developer myself anymore. But this is a, a little company internal app, so yeah, I can still develop a bit on, on that. Um, yeah, I'm working for a Munich-based um, IT consultancy called My One Wolf. Um, and we have offices in multiple cities in Germany, Tunis, Valencia. And yeah, surprise, we are hiring. So yeah, you know that already. Um, <clears throat> a little background, I had a, a, quite a rough ride <laughs> to this talk because I had this little shoulder accident four weeks ago and a surgery three weeks ago. So I was not able to sit on a computer until recently. Um, so forgive me if the slides are the worst you have ever seen. Um, I think the content is OK. Uh, and I did them on Miro, um, which I, I use a lot. Uh, I forgot to start my timer. So um, I'll probably have to switch a bit between the presentation mode and um, the, yeah, to be able to zoom in for the code. Probably the people in the latest rows have to tell me if you can read it. And then I can zoom in. So um, the talk will be not very general. It's an experience report. It's how we, how we did it and um, what we discovered, what we sort of learned. So I will not do a lot of general appraisal about how cool event sourcing is, but it is really cool. Um, and um, also not talking generally about what projections are. I guess you sort of know that. And I'm saying that already now, we normally don't do questions at the end, but I'll be around at the conference. So you can um, just approach me and talk about anything. That's hard with the right hand with the microphone on the right. So um, <clears throat> what am I going to talk about? First, I'll explain uh, the game a bit, um, the history. Um, and the mechanics of the game, the rules. And um, then I'm going to talk about um, <clears throat> how we implemented it uh, with Event Store. Um, things we did not know before, we changed, and that for sure caused some design issues. So it's not a talk that pretends everything is super easy with event sourcing. Um, and generally, you all know that. Um, Stuff you didn't know when you made some decisions might make stuff a bit complicated later. Um, then another point is how defensive um, <clears throat> should we be with our own events. And I have some optional stuff written here. Let's see how it goes. I don't know exactly how long the talk will be. So I would have some extra content if you come uh, to this point or if we have enough time at the end. OK, uh, uh, before I showed uh, what the app looks like, the history. So this used to be analog uh, cards. Um, in the department I worked before, in production department, um, <clears throat> we had these cards. And at the weekly meeting, um, everybody could take a card and it has some, some tasks or has a, tar a task on it, each card, that you could do. And it, it's, it's a social app, as it, as it said. Um, so the idea is to get to know the department better, your colleagues, um, the company. So some examples are help organizing a department event, um, go to lunch with one of the CEOs, the board of directors, some agile um, and XP stuff. So yeah, mostly social uh, background. Yeah, and then there was some pandemic. You might have heard about it. It's something we see. And there were no, no weekly meetings in the office anymore. And we decided um, <clears throat> to make that an app. And it looks like that. So a player always um, has uh, three cards in their hand. Um, you can see there is one on the left and one on the right. And this is the middle one. You can swipe to read all the cards. 
Um, it has some title and some description what you should do. So in this case, present your project in the weekly. Um, and then it has points that you get when you finish this card, do this task. And we also see here with the crown, that's my rank. So I'm at this point in time, I was on rank three. And this is the total uh, amount of, of uh, points I have collected. And yeah, this is from Dev Environment. Um, I show some other screens later. And then when you, when you click on that card, you can uh, either finish the card or reject the card. And when you reject it, <clears throat> you just get a new card. So you see this is a different one. So um, yeah, if you get a, a task that you just don't like, you can reject it. But you cannot just keep on rejecting the stuff because th then this will happen. So it will tell you, hey, you can only reject it once or a card once every uh, seven days. And you have to wait another whatever to reject your next card. And why does it say four minutes here? Because it's from Dev Environment or from local environment. Uh, yeah, from Dev Environment was right. And we have configured it for five minutes there to, to be able to test. But theoretically, four minutes would also make sense if I have rejected the last card almost seven days ago. So um, <clears throat> you would have to wait. And quickly going back, when you decide to finish this card, or you say you have finished this task, so you have presented your project in the weekly, then you will see this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, with some animation, I think. Uh, congratulations, and you earned, they say eight coins here. The language is not perfectly aligned everywhere. Eight points, whatever it is. Awesome, and you can dismiss this. And um, just showing this one event that this causes, because this is the only event that our gamification for the achievements that I show later um, care about. They don't care about the rejected events for, for the time being or anything else. So a card finished event would look like that. It has a, um, a player ID and it has a finished card and a replacement card and some metadata. Um, that's all value objects, if anybody cares. Um, it's so, yeah, I mean, he, here is a, a JSON example. So a replacement card, you get drawn automatically from the system. So yes, because one of the rules of the business rules of the game is you always have three cards. Um, so you automatically randomly get, get drawn um, another card. Um, <clears throat> Probably memorize that there is an occurred at timestamp. That's um, something we see later um, when we talk about the problems. Um, you see here, um, this is a, some ESO format with a, with a time zone. Um, yeah. So um, this is the event we care about for the gamification for the achievements. Um, just showing some other screens. Um, here I finished enough cards that I, my rank changed. It was three, now it's two, and I had to finish a couple of cards to, to reach that. Now I had 93 before, and now it's 117. Um, <clears throat> so and we, this screen is currently on the left side. As I said, you can swipe the three cards that you have in your hand. And Another screen we have is the history of finished cards. So you could scroll that up or down to see all the other cards you have already finished. And <clears throat> this is also important. Um, another feature we have, and that was added later as the red text um, says it was, was added after we went to production in the department. Um, we have deck collections and you can some of them, like the fundamentals, are mandatory, and the others you can select, like this one, or you can uh, unselect. So I could now unselect this one or select this one. Yeah, and we'll see what implications uh, this had introducing the deck feature um, later, because we didn't know some things. Okay. 
Yeah, now showing some of the achievements that we have already implemented. So the question to the people back there, I guess you cannot read the, the code. So let me just zoom in a bit. So that's the, the first and the simplest one, first task ever. I guess the title says it, whenever you finish your first card, you will uh, gain this achievement. And uh, the specification is very simple because all you can do is disable it, feature toggle it. Um, for first task ever, you don't need any other uh, specification. And then below that, we have one that's already a bit more sophisticated, number of tasks. And we see it also has the, the switch and then it has level specifications, so an array of level specifications, which have, oops, which have a level, uh, a bonus score you get when you reach that level and the number of tasks you need to finish to reach that level, basically. And if you, if you look a bit here, we see level zero is sort of useless. Um, I just made that to, yeah, that things start at zero. That's a bit easier to read in code. But yeah, level one, you get one extra point and you need to finish three tasks and it goes on like that. Level two, another point and five, five tasks to finish it. But it's not more complicated than that. And then we just move on. First card of deck, that's equally primitive as the first task ever. It, it's only toggleable. You need no, no further specification. But here is the sort of most sophisticated one, hardest to implement basically the percentage of deck. So um, we see instead of a number of tasks that the other one had, we have a percentage of, this, uh, of, of the deck. So when you, for example, have finished 15% of the cards of this deck, you will reach level one and get one point as a bonus score. Okay, now I switch back. And we move, uh, yeah, before I move on, um, so I said I, I'll not do much general talking about how cool this stuff is. So um, when we are on this screen, we could easily implement other achievements. There is one that's already planned. Um, I don't remember, remember what it is, but um, anything we can think of, because we know with an event source system, we have all the information basically captured um, ideally. Um, and additionally, we have the time component. So we could now relatively easy uh, think uh, of, an, of an achievement that's, I don't know, when you finish five tasks in a week, you get a million extra points. We could also do a punishment achievement, what would probably be named different. Yeah, When you reject three cards in one month, then you get five minus points. Uh, for sure, we would have to consume one more event, but that would be would be easy. So that's the cool thing about events. One of the cool things about event sourcing, you can implement a lot of stuff that you did not think of. Uh, you did not know that you what information you will need in the future because you're just capturing all the information ideally that's happening in the system with event sourcing. So. <clears throat> Now we move on to yeah, the second bigger point, our implementation with events.db. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the schema is, is quite easy. We have subscriptions in ESDB. And whenever a, a new card finished event uh, happens, it's consumed by, the, by an event handler, which dispatches it to a command handler. And if some achievement was, was reached by that, it will create new whatever achievement achieved um, event and yeah, store it uh, to the database. And um, more the technical details, um, we are using so-called catch-up um, subscriptions in event store and not um, persistent subscriptions. Um, Persistent subscriptions maintain the checkpoint, how far you have read automatically, but we are not using them. We are using catch up where you have to maintain your, 
your position in, in, in the stream of, of changes by yourself. And I wrote this sentence, I honestly don't remember what was the technical reason for not using the persistent subscriptions and maybe it's Oscar, Oscar Dudic's fault. And I talked to Oscar yesterday, so he told me um, his answer was, uh, yeah, the order is not guaranteed in the persistent um, subscriptions and they are quite heavy. Um, and so you generally with catch-up subscriptions, you need to do some boilerplate to yeah, store this, uh, commit this, this checkpoint where you are, but you are very free to implement whatever you like. The order is guaranteed. So it's when you have done this, this boilerplate code um, once right, then everything is happy. So did the order really matter in this? In, in our case, not. I think I'll, I'll mention that a bit later when we, when we look uh, at the code. So, um, yeah, and then we have <clears throat> um, a, a very much a one-to-one -one mapping. So it's one subscription pair achievement. It's one event handler pair achievement in runtime. Each achievement can be feature toggled in the global uh, configuration. And each achievement runs completely independent, um, which is, is really cool that stuff does not interfere with each other. A quick look into the configuration. So the lower part is more interesting for us. Now we see those four achievements I've shown in my local dev environment, they're all enabled. So I could uh, disable them. Um, and um, yeah, they would just do nothing. There would, there would be no subscription that something is listening to and nothing would happen. And even in the, in the code that does the command handling, it's, it's switched off. So when even when event would, events would come in because we, we messed it up somewhere, then the, the code would do nothing with it. So it's basically sort of hexagonal architecture-ish, the separation between the infrastructure code and the domain code. They are both independently respecting the configuration. A quick look into the event handler implementation. Um, same question, I need to zoom into the code, I guess. So this is so the implementation is in Golang, the best language ever invented, in case you didn't know. Um, and this is valid Go code, but I left out everything. It's uh, all the details. It's just to show, yeah, the the, the schema basically the, the process. So what we do uh, when the application starts. Um, an event handler is started as a Go routine. Um, one of the big uh, yeah, advantages of Go is very lightweight and easy concurrency handling. So you just start a Go routine, it runs in the background forever until you cancel it, whatever. Super easy to do. And we see this is for a subscription, um, the achievement uh, first task ever. I prefixed it with all because it's using the all stream in event store DB. And I already mentioned um, we only care for the um, card finished events for the time being. So that's why we have this event type here. Um, I'm lying a bit here actually what this event type that's get passed here is an array. It doesn't matter. We could say this is a list of different events. Um, it would still work. Yeah, and then what we have to do is uh, get a checkpoint, um, a subscription checkpoint from, from event store. Uh, with this subscription ID. This behind the scenes would create um, a checkpoint with position zero if this, um, this does not exist yet. Um, so the first time I would switch on the feature toggle for a new achievement, it would happen the first time. It would um, create this uh, subscription checkpoint with position zero. And the checkpoints <coughs> are um, stored in regular streams in the SDB, um, but they are kept to the size of one. That's one trick that Oscar told me. I'm also reading backwards um, and only one event, very defensive code. I probably, I don't remember, but I guess I've implemented reading backwards with size one before Oscar told me about the trick to cap it to one. So this is so safe, whatever, whatever is messed up, it will still do the right thing. Um, 
Yeah, and then um, <clears throat> we have our checkpoint and we need to subscribe to the subscription. So we subscribe to the subscription with that subscription ID at this checkpoint and filter for the event type or event types that we have specified here. And the subscription is created automatically in ESDB if it doesn't exist, so you don't have to care about that a lot. Um, and I, as I mentioned, it subscribes to the all stream and filters for these event types. And then it's just an endless loop, um, receiving new events, um, storing a subscription checkpoint. And yeah, here it says it's a bit sloppy to, co to commit that first. It's a two-phase commit-ish thing. Um, because only then we handle it, we create a, a command um, for yeah, this achievement. And then we basically grant achievements is handling this command and then yeah, causing new, new achievement events. And what if that fails? The checkpoint is already committed. Oh my god, uh, do I need to implement two-phase commits? Uh, no, <clears throat> we don't, because the system is, in a sense, self-healing. It's very, what's the right word? Um, yeah, it's, it, it's just safe, because the next time um, a uh, card finished event would happen, it would just do the work that it has missed. So nothing bad happens here. Yes? Uh, this is a mobile app, right? And this is the back end. Right? This is the back end, yes, 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 for sure. So um, it would automatically catch up what it has missed um, and nothing bad happens. And I mean, it's also, it's an, a company internal social app, so nobody will die, no money will be lost, but yeah, it's still, it's auto healing. And then a quick look into uh, the grant achievements command handler. I'm using the terms here a bit sloppy. When I say command handler, that's the whole process of handling a command. So it, there might be a component that actually has a name with command handler. And then there is code that you would probably say, this is an aggregate. I'm also very sloppy with aggregates, but that's, that's a different story. It's all the code that's needed to handle an an, a command. And yeah, we have one command handling function per achievement. And all it does is read an, uh, the event stream for the player who has, done, his, has, has finished this card and then loop over all the events, build a list of all achievements of uh, that type um, that were reached, um, dump them or some of them if they have already been granted in the past. That's what I just say, it would catch up um, if, if something was, did not work before. And then um, if there are new achievements, commit those new events to the event store. And yeah, can you spot the item potency? Um, so it calculates hey, what achievements are in the bag, but the ones that have already been committed, it dumps. So when you run that five times, um, it only happens once that a new achievement um, event is, is basically created or committed. Okay. Now, I need to find out how to go back. Good. So it's, it, it's a very solid system, but very simple to implement. And that's the cool thing about it. It's not performance optimized, obviously, but yeah, I mean, we all know premature optimization. Often there is no reason to optimize for performance. And yeah, because um, we said the system generates achievement events, I'm just showing one of them for the first task ever achieved. Um, so yeah, it just has a, a, a player ID, a level of this achievement, the bonus score, and then the same metadata we have already seen before. Um, and other um, achievement events look a bit differently because um, they might not have a level. So this, this first, um, now push it. First task ever. Yeah, okay. In this case, it's it's a bit sloppy. Um, it has a level of zero and a bonus score uh, that's fixed. I think. I just wanted to show one of those events, and yeah, here is the the JSON code again for that. Uh, yeah, the the level one and the bonus score one is even hard coded in in the code, I guess. Um, so. 
Yeah, that's the start of the, the next bigger point. As I said, those um, design decisions we made and those new features we, we introduced and we didn't know beforehand. So the deck set or deck selection feature we introduced before we did the achievements, but when the system was already in production. Before that, there was just a collection of cards. And then we said, hey, we want to have different decks. And yeah, each card, uh, each, each deck has, uh, has some of those cards. So, so what does that mean? Do you, do you achieve on different, have achievement levels for each deck or events? Or is it, those are just your cards? I'm not sure if I get the question, Rebecca. Oh, so do you achieve, have, the, are you, each deck that you have, as, as a user, do you can you achieve three different ways if you have three different decks? Yeah, so you can, with, with those two achievements that are deck-based, yes, it's per, per deck. So you can have a first yeah. card of deck for the three decks we have, and you can have percentage of deck for each of those decks. Okay. Exactly. But yeah, so... Um, I, I just quickly go, go what I, through what I've written that a deck set is a collection of all decks and each deck has a collection of cards. Um, and it's also a very sloppy implementation. Um, decks are just JSON files. Um, and this means there is no history, no events of anything deck related. If a deck was added, deleted cards in, in the deck were added, deleted, moved, that's all not there. Um, so that's when you don't do event sourcing in some parts. Um, and we also missed to add uh, the deck information to the card finished event because now there is new information. A, a card is not just the information about the card, but probably also in which deck was it. And yeah, we didn't do that, ouch. Um, <clears throat> the cards are also just a JSON file. Yeah, but why you, you fucking lazy, whatever. Now, because it's an intern lab, everybody is doing that in their learning time. And we just did, we decided we don't want to implement an admin interface for the cards and decks. That probably might have been more work than what we already have. So what you, what the people should be able to use is play and not yeah, um, spend days on implementing an admin interface. And you can always blame me and I will blame Oscar um, for yeah, some reason. Now, joke aside. Um, that's just what we did, and we have to live with the consequences. And <clears throat> quick deck example. So a deck has an ID, a title, an image, the flag if it's mandatory, and some card IDs. And then the same for a card. This is not very spectacular. I just quickly show it. So cards have an ID, an image, a headline, a category, a description, a quote that was on the lower end of the cards, and the score, which is important for the achievements, uh, obviously. And go back to this mode. So, um, yeah, what problems does this cause? Um, yeah, for those two achievements we've seen, first card of deck and percentage of deck, we need to know which deck a card belongs to. So now, as we don't have this in the card finished events, we need to look into the deck. And that means um, we have to inject the deck set into our command handling. And I personally hate that in injecting some other collection into basically aggregates. I try to avoid that, but yeah, here, that's the only way to get this information. And um, if decks are deleted, yeah, we won't be able to assign or to find out basically um, the deck that a card belongs to. So we need to know this information. Otherwise, we can say, hey, this is the first card of deck A, or this is 15% of deck A. Um, so current state, nobody touches or must just touch the, the deck or card stuff. Only developers should do that, that know what they are doing. Um, yeah. And to make it more complicated, there is a temporal, temporal component. What if a card is moved from deck A to B? Should it be added to deck based achievements for deck A or deck B? 
what's the information uh, with the information in the events we would we could just make that a business decision right we could say hey when a card was moved we only grant the achievement for where it's now or we could say we we do it at the point in time um, when it was finished or whatever but yeah we don't have that um, so now we can basically only say when it moved from a to b we grant an achievement for deck b um, but we might have already added this achievement for deck A in the past, so that's what's on the image. Yesterday, the gray card here was in deck A, and it, there was a card was finished, and it might have led to some achievement. And today, we are moving it uh, to deck B, and tomorrow, <clears throat> there is another card finished event, and now this same card might pay into the achievement for, um, for deck B. Um, as I've mentioned, nobody will die in this case, no money will be lost, but if this would be a, a commercial application or it would be something with airplane or nuclear power plant, then yeah, it wouldn't be so sloppy. So yeah, um, at, I guess at this point when we, when we introduced the DEXED feature, I was sort of a bit sleepy. Um, or whatever, a bit lazy, and I didn't think that through. But at that point in time, before we moved that in production, it would have been possible to yeah, mitigate that and say anything before the deck sets is deck whatever, deck zero, deck right. blah, and then in the future we add the deck information. But yeah, wishful thinking, we haven't done it, I haven't done it, um, so yeah, now we have to live with that. and. If we ever want to really mitigate that, we would have to do some stream migration or something like that. Okay, more code mitigating this problem. Um, now, the, the, don't look, stare at this code too much. The, the only thing that's important is around this comment. Um, so basically we say, hey, there is an event in the stream and it's a card finished event and then we try to find the deck containing this card and in go there are no exceptions so you typically return uh, errors in this case it's a boolean so we say yeah we get back the deck if we find it and we get back a boolean if it exists and then we have to say if it does not exist we gracefully ignore uh, because yeah, the finished card is not in any deck set should not be possible, lol. Um, and the best thing we can do is just continue, so ignore this. Um, otherwise, it would be bullshit. Um, and you might think, okay, this is exactly one if block and one comment. Um, not so bad. But for sure, there's an extra test case for that. So that's also not hugely complicated. Um, but it's code to maintain. We all know that um, each line of code is a liability and can have errors and tests can fail and you have to dive in. So it's not what we, what we wish to have, but we need to do it. Yeah, and now we are basically already diving into um, the last point, um, how defensive should we be? Um, yeah, when we project the event stream to build a decision state or a view, how much do we trust our own events? I mean, our system has created those events, sounds uh, we should trust them. But if we produce faulty events or event streams, our problem is where they are produced and not where, where they are used. But still, we need to make a decision. We are using those events now uh, for something and how much should we trust them? So you cannot just ignore that that fact um, now I need to zoom in again um, so this is a projection for the achievement view so basically what the app will show I don't have a screenshot because this is actually not yet in production or not yet fully implemented um, so again the interesting code is around the comment mitigate out of order events um, <clears throat> so for the number of tasks level up achieved achievement, 
it, there is some code that says, hey, only when the actual event has um, a level that is higher than what we have memorized, the highest level we have seen so far, then we say, yeah, this is the new highest level. Otherwise, we basically ignore it. Because um, if we would not do that, as we see in the test case for that, um, here we have an first an um, event with achievement level two, and then comes one with achievement level one. So events are in the wrong order. And we would say, actually, so the system would suggest, actually, we have level two, but we go back to level one. Um, that's not what we want. So um, that's why, yeah, this, this little block of code is, is there comparing the highest level and only moving it forward basically when the level is higher. That would mean that if you've got a correcting event, that that would never be applied. Say if you, somebody has the wrong achievement, you can't correct it anymore. Yeah, I, if a correction event would be um, of a different of a different type, probably. So we could handle that uh, differently. We could have special handling for for a correction event. The same type. Yeah. 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 So I just scroll over here because I need to zoom in again. More examples of defensive code, but this time we really must mitigate it in, in some way. Because before, what we have just seen with the defensiveness about the level, we could just say we trust our events and this will not happen. I thought your streams were ordered the way you were. Yeah, I mean, so how, how the, the stream would get into that state, that's a different question. Um, okay. Yeah, you, you, that's, that's always you say, hey, normally, we know what we have implemented. We trust Event Store. Can we trust Event Store? 100%. We can 100%. Fine. <laughs> so, um, but that's not how you write code, right? Um, you have to expect that something is not as you expected. Um, expect the unexpected. So, um, yeah, no, but it's always, it's always a decision and it's always, there are drawbacks. So, but, on the left side, on the, on the, in the code we've seen before, we could say, hey, nothing bad will happen. Somebody will not have the level. It's OK. But here, in this example, with the timestamp, remember I, I mentioned the timestamp as a string in the events um, in, a, in an ISO format. There is Go code that parses this timestamp. And for sure, this Go code, when this is when it doesn't look like a timestamp, but it says Rebecca um, in there, then it would create an error. And we cannot just ignore this error. Mm -hmm. So um, we would have to return an error in this case. And here is one usage of this code that tries to get a timestamp instead of just a string from, from the event because it needs to decide if this event was recently achieved. That's a Boolean function. And here, again, I write gracefully a lot in that code. I love that word so much. Um, so gracefully ignore if the event has a broken timestamp. And here I can just say, yeah, I can return false um, or true or whatever. I need to return something fixed. And only if, if that's fine, we do the actual um, math with the time don't the details are not so important here so another piece of of graceful handling and there is another piece ensure reject is not locked you remember you can only reject the card once every seven days so we need to do some math um, uh, with the with the time so here again it says gracefully ignore broken occurred at an event um, so if there is a parsing error, we return false. Um, so is locked would say, no, it's not locked. This feature is not locked currently. If we would instead say, hey, when we don't have a valid timestamp, we just take now, then nobody or this, this player could not reject the card anymore because every time this code runs now is, is a different point in time now. And it would always say, um, you just rejected the card. You can't reject the card anymore. So here the defensive graceful code is, is saying, yeah, so what? You, you have rejected a card maybe yesterday, I don't know, but I just allow it to you. It's not the worst that can happen. Um, okay. Yes? So I understand it's some kind of resilience and defensive mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, 
but how um, possible it is that it ever occurs. So have, have right. you seen it? No, it's know? it's completely impossible unless a bit flips. But that's that's this this stupid situation. You you know this cannot happen normally. Yeah, normally. Yeah, I, I only can think of that maybe um, someone put in a wrong server code that runs for a short time. Yeah. And then you you find out okay it's totally broken. Have to, to fix it. Yeah, it's somebody could have broken the code. So it's a different timestamp format. We are expecting when we parse it, it's in ISO blah 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 with time zone. And somebody changed that accidentally, and then there are a couple of events with broken, unparsable timestamps, or a bit flipped, or somebody at event store had a very bad day, which will never happen. And one in a trillion events will be broken. I don't know. So this is always, I mean, it, it, Greg Young, I read something from Greg Young many years ago. You should not, he said sort of, you should not protect against things that very rarely happen and are easily fixable by a human in a couple of hours or a day. So you would not want to implement code for a month that will only happen once every couple of years and it takes you two hours to fix it. So, but here the, the, the graceful handling is not exactly super complicated. It's relatively cheap and that's just why we do it instead of ignoring it. So on the other hand, I've seen code where you throw things away that really could happen. Mm. And, and that's bad. So this gracefully is kind of nice. Yeah, my concern is more that it actually pulls in application and infrastructure concerns into your domain layer because you're testing your application or your infrastructure problems. So I think they, those mm -hmm. tests should be are in separate? here, yeah. they are separate. You mm. should be able to trust the data that you get into your domain layer. Yeah, but as I said, not just because if somebody messed up the timestamp format in code, then it's not really an infrastructure problem. But I get you, I get your point. Here is. The, 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 the answer sort of is it's, re it's really easy to implement that and it's not very expensive. There is one test case somewhere, there is a one if block and that's why we just handle it gracefully. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, we come to the general question, how defensive should everybody be? Um, and yeah, no general recommendation because it depends. I had to uh, put it depends here because uh, yeah, we always like this consultant language. But yeah, I'm not a, a bad consultant. So I guess some good heuristics starting points might be be very or more defensive when it's pro pro uh, when projecting a decision uh, state. So command handling basically. And then keep in mind, views can also be decision states for the user of the system. So when anybody makes a decision by looking at the screen and clicking here or there, it's just a decision made by a human and not by code. And you can normally be less defensive in views that are just informative. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, check if graceful handling is possible, what the consequences might be. So in our little application, we might not grant some achievement or we might let somebody reject a card even if they rejected one yesterday. So the consequences are uh, neglectable. It's, it's not very bad. Um, you, can, you can do that. And apart from that, um, yeah, I mean, for sure, decide on your own, depending on the domain, uh, the severity, will there be money lost? Will there be dead people, whatever, burning? Um, and also according to your taste and style, I cannot neglect that. It's a bit of how defensive you, you are on, on the more detail level. It's a bit of, of, of taste and style in, in my books. And you can also not always say better safe than sorry, because I, as I've shown that, um, it has a price in code. There are test cases you probably need to write and code is a liability. I've said that best line of code is the one that is never written. So, yes, exactly. My, my, I, in, in, I don't know what your ratio of, depends on the language and the frameworks, what your ratio between production and test code is. I think in my case, the way I write code with Golang and the testing framework I use, it's still 
one to one and a half or one to two. So one and a half or two times the amount of test code than production code. So um, that might also be a factor. Uh, yeah, and just in time, I guess. Yeah, one minute left. That was it. Uh, that's the end. Thank you much for your time and attention. We said we, we don't do questions. So, Maxim, can I just throw in some of the extra stuff? So, I, I'll just briefly mention that. So, uh, let's just go back to the first one. Uh, second one. So, some things that might be interesting for, for some of you. We have implemented for GDPR uh, reasons privacy um, the throw away the key strategy. So, when one of our company um, employees starts to using the app, basically there is an event called player enrolled or something. And the only GDPR relevant information that's there is their um, company email address. But still our infrastru uh, technical infrastructure department insisted that we make that super privacy cool. So if somebody leaves the company, this data should be gone. And I have a, an opinion about that, but yeah, whatever. Um, that's what they, they, they said we have to do. So, I mean, on the other hand, I always waited for be, being able to, to implement the throw away the key strategy, so we just did it. So, the email address is encrypted. Um, there is an, an encryption key that it's uh, asymmetric, uh, sy symmetric, so you can decode it with that key. Um, and that's stored um, on disk in the system. And when somebody either decides to not use the app anymore, or when he or she was inactive for, I think, six months, that was somewhere in the configuration, then we do the same, then we unregister or whatever it's called, this player. And this key is deleted. So the system would still work. We, we still have the events. Um, we could still say how the person played, but we cannot say who that was. Uh, there is no way to un decrypt the privacy in, uh, inform relevant information, the email address. And um, <clears throat> the other thing is, a decision we made about duplicate cards because, as you remember, one of the um, of the uh, business rules is that a player must always have three cards in their hand. So, um, <clears throat> what would happen when um, you you basically finished the second la third last card? You cannot pull a new card anymore that you have not have had before. So we said it's it's simpler to allow duplicate cards. We just make sure when, when you finish one card, there are two cards left and we make sure the new card is not the one you just finished or one of the two you already have in your hand. So in your hand, there will be no duplicate at this moment in time. But you might, if you play the game long enough, you might finish the same card twice, three times, five times, whatever. Um, so and when you get the next card, what is getting the next No, it's that's always randomized. Oh, so okay. all it's basically all cards in all decks that you have activated, and then I've okay. implemented some cool randomized whatever function, and it's pulling one of the cards. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry, we don't have time for a question because next talk is in five minutes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. For